There we go. Right, so we'll kick off. I just want to do a couple of announcements. Um, so uh, the first thing to say is that obviously we just had the NHSR NHS PyCom conference, and it was a very uh, resounding success. Uh, for those of you who were there or for those of you who were attended online, if you didn't attend in person or online, or even if you did, uh, you should know that we are going to be publishing as much as many of the talks as we can, which is nearly all of them. I think there were one or two uh, that didn't want to be recorded for various reasons, which is fair enough, um, but we'll be publishing most of them um, as soon as we can, um, and they'll live on on our YouTube. Uh, our YouTube is already great, so go and have a look at it sometime. There's loads of useful stuff from all of the conferences that we've done on there already. Um, there's some workshops upcoming as well. So we have an intro to R&R Studio, which is very popular and well attended always. That's forthcoming. Um, and we also have someone um, has offered to run a session all about GitHub Actions. So one of the talks at the conference was about GitHub Actions. And I believe in that talk, they said, if you're interested in GitHub Actions, I'll be doing a workshop. I will be organizing that workshop in November. So look out for that. Um, and the last thing to say about the conference is, um, I mean, I think it was absolutely fantastically resounding success, as I said at the time, and I'll say again to anybody who wants to listen, uh, but we are doing a survey um, to find out what was good and bad about it. As I mentioned at the conference, we kind of re-ran last year's conference this year deliberately because we've got a new team in looking after it, so we didn't want to move too much stuff around. But for next year, we've got a very kind of sincere wish to move the chairs, move the tables, move the venue, move the what, do it totally differently. One day, three day, eight day, you know, online, you name it, any combination of things. Um, so if you've got views about how it could be done better and how it was done this time, then please share them in the survey, which will be going out very soon. Right, with all that said, thank you very much to Ryan. Ryan is a great friend to the NHSR community, well, as is POSIT in general. And Ryan has come to talk to us today about package management with our studio. Over to you, Ryan. All right, thanks, Chris. All right, so like Chris mentioned, today's session is going to be all about package management in R. And we've been doing a, quite a few presentations and workshops and webinars with your group. So hopefully for a lot of folks on the line, you recognize my bald head. But if this is your first time meeting me, and this is the first time meeting you. My name is Ryan Johnson. I'm a data science advisor here at Posit. Uh, part of my role is just to make sure that Everyone on your team is familiar with our open source tools, also our professional tools, and also just passing on some, you know, R and Python, you know, best practices. And so that's kind of what we're going to be talking about mostly today. As we go through today's session, I highly encourage you to use the Zoom chat for any questions, and I'll be sure to keep that window open on my screen so I can see those questions coming in. Um, but I'm also okay if you have any questions as we go through any pressing questions, feel free to unmute yourself, scream into the microphone, ask any questions live. I'm totally okay with that as well. I like to keep these very fun, casual, uh, and a nice safe learning environment. And then I will be sharing the slides with you all uh, directly afterwards. So no need to kind of have your notepad and pencil ready. You can just sit back, relax, and take it all in. I also will say that there will be a few moments during today's session that if you want to follow along and actually write some R code, it'll be very minimal R code, but if you do have RStudio open, either your local desktop application, or maybe you're using Posit Cloud or Posit Workbench, wherever you access RStudio, just feel free to have that open. And then I'll kind of uh, direct you to that um, RStudio session a little bit as we go through today's session. So what are we gonna talk about today? Well, this is going to be all about package management in R. So obviously, we're going to be talking about packages, but we're also going to be focusing on libraries and repositories. These are going to be the big three topics for today's session. We're going to talk about what happens when things go wrong in your package management strategy, and also some strategies and tools to either prevent things from going wrong uh, or to kind of uh, fix them if they happen to. Here's some other resources that um, I collected when creating this presentation. So again, I'll forward these slides over. Uh, some great presentations, some documentation to read through. And then one more thing to keep in mind before we dive into today's topic. If you're hoping I was going to stand up here and say, this is how you manage your packages in R. That would be great if I could do that. But unfortunately, there is no single solution for managing packages in R. And why is that? That's because every team is a little bit different. So here I have listed just a few variables that can differ from one team to the next, such as, are you running R in R Studio locally on your desktop or are you running on a server? Are you in an air-gapped or offline environment? 
Do you work in what's, what's known as a validated environment, very popular with our pharmaceutical uh, customers? How secure is your IT or security team? You know, who manages the environment? Is that the users or the admin? And can a data scientist update a package to the latest and greatest, or are they kind of locked down to a specific uh, version? So because all of these things differ from one team to the next, again, we're not going to have a single solution for you all, but my goal is to provide you with um, a lot of topics and things to consider so that you can uh, develop your own internal package management strategy specific for your group. So to kick things off, I'm going to show on the screen here an error message that no matter who you are, um, if you've written any bit of R code, I guarantee you at some point you've hit this error message. So what are we doing here? So we're trying to load the ggplot2 package, which is popular for data visualization, using the library function in R. And we get this scary red text saying there is no package called ggplot2. Now, if you've been using R for a couple of years now, you may know exactly what's going on here. But put yourself in the shoes of someone who has never used R or is just starting to use R. An error message like this generates a lot of questions. Like, where can I find ggplot2? Do I already have ggplot2 installed? If not, how do I install it? What version am I installing? And then where do I put it after I install it? That's a lot of questions and can certainly be overwhelming, again, for those that are new to R. So to tackle this question and some other related questions, we're going to focus in on these three topics. Obviously, we have packages, libraries, and repositories. Now, I personally, uh, when I was first learning about package management in R, and I was trying to think of some ways that to, to kind of help explain these three concepts, I came up with this analogy, which I've used potentially in some other uh, presentations for your group, but I always think it's good to go back to. So let's say you are in the market for a brand new car, right? So this is you, and you want a new car. So what do you do? Well, typically, you're going to find yourself at a car dealership. So you shop around the car dealership, and eventually you find the car of your dreams, your brand new car. So you purchase that car, you sit inside of it, you turn it on, you drive it home, and then you park it in your garage at home. Let's say a year goes by, and for some reason you need another new car. So what do you do? Same thing, you go back to that car dealership, you buy another new car, you jump inside of it, you turn it on, you drive it home, and you park it in your garage. So now you have two cars in your garage. And then you can repeat this process as many times as you want for every new car that you uh, you purchase. Now, again, a pretty silly analogy, but it does, I think, uh, play nicely with uh, the R ecosystem when it comes to package management. So focusing just on the cars. Cars are what you interact with. You turn them on and you drive them home. These are your packages, because when you're writing code, you interact with packages. Now, for your cars, you park them in a garage. For your packages, you park them inside of what's known as a library. All right, so your garage in this analogy is your library. And then where do you go shopping for new cars? Well, that's your car dealership. But where do you go shopping for new packages? That's your repository. All right, so again, silly analogy, but it's, it personally, it helped me a lot when trying to understand these uh, various concepts. Now, again, let's just throw some formal definitions at you just so you have them. And focusing on the R package, a package is a standardized collection of material that extends R. So you're gonna find code, data, documentation, all inside these packages. But the take home message, you interact with packages. When you're writing R code, you are typically using functions within packages. Next, we have your R library. This is a place, and it's going to be a directory, like a physical directory on your computer or server where R knows to find packages it can use. In other words, this is where you store packages. And then you have your R repository, and this is the primary vehicle for organizing and distributing R packages in other words, this is where you install packages from. So we're going to talk about each one of those three. So, And we're going to start with the package. So what is the package? I think pretty much probably everyone on the call here has leveraged a package at some point in their R um, journey here. 
But I think this is a really important statement here. Um, it's kind of like outside of today's topic, but in R, the fundamental unit of shareable code is the package. If you have a piece of R code that you use a lot, all right, and you copy and paste it multiple times, maybe you want to share it with your future self in another project, or you want to share it with a colleague, that's where you should take that code, put it inside of a function, place it inside of a package, and then you can easily share that package. So inside of most packages, you're going to find these four things. Obviously, you'll find your code. Your package may have some data that's needed for that package, um, or maybe just some data to play around with. All great packages have good documentation. And maybe you'll find some unit tests in there as well, just to make sure the package is behaving correctly. And all of these get wrapped up into a nice, pretty package, which I purposely put in this hexagon shape, because as many of you know, authors of packages love to create what's known as hex logos for their packages. And here at Posit, we are no exception to this rule. We've created tons of open source packages. And here I'm just showing a handful of them, some of our more popular ones. So for example, we have Shiny for creating interactive web apps using R. Um, there's also a Python equivalent as well. R Markdown for static reports, GT for tables, uh, a few other packages. And then you can see down here, ggplot2, which we've already introduced to your team for data visualization. And we're really just going to focus in on ggplot2 today for uh, um, this workshop. So when it comes to packages, there's really two big questions that we need to answer. How do you install it? And how do you then load it? So looking at the first question, how do you install a package? And going back to the car analogy, this is on par of trying to purchase the car. So how do you purchase the package, install the package? Fortunately, within R, there's a very intuitive function called install.packages. And then in open quotes and parentheses, we just give it the name of the package. All right, so that will install the package so it becomes yours. But once you've purchased said package, all right, you need to be able to turn it on, just like you would turn on a car so you can drive it home. So to load a package into your environment so you can use all the great functions inside of it, we use the library function. And same syntax, open parentheses. The quotes here are actually optional, but sometimes it's useful just to know that you can use quotes. So for both of these functions, you can always have the package name in quotes, and you just give it the package name. So knowing what you know now about packages, let's go back to that error message we saw on the first slide where we tried to load the ggplot2 package, but we got an error message saying there is no package called ggplot2. So what's going on here? Well, it turns out we tried to load a package without first installing it. This is basically trying to turn on a car without actually owning the car. So we're going to jump over to our first live demo. And again, if you have our studio open in your on your computer, or if you're logged into Posit Workbench, anywhere, feel free to follow along and you can run some of these commands with me. But we're going to go ahead and walk through the process of installing and loading your very first R package. And we're again, we're going to focus in here on ggplot2. Now I'm going to use Posit Workbench for my environment. So this is an RStudio session um, hosted in Posit Workbench. And what you're seeing over here in this top left quadrant, this is an R Markdown document. I have some code here in these code chunks uh, interspersed with some text right here. So let me just go ahead and set the stage here. And we're going to come down to this first code chunk where we're going to try to load the ggplot2 package. Now, before I run this code chunk, I want you to think of this environment like a, a blank slate. Like you just installed R for the first time. You just installed R Studio. You go to load ggplot2. So if I run this code, we get that same error message we just saw. There is no package called ggplot2, but now we know what to do. We need to install it. We need to purchase said package. So we'll come down here to the second. Actually, let me go ahead and I'm just going to clear all my output here. All right, so we're going to go ahead and install the ggplot2. So I'm going to go ahead and hit play. And again, feel free to run this command in your own environment. When you run this, you may see some output that's different from mine, and that's totally okay. As long as you're not seeing an error message, then you can be pretty confident that this package was installed correctly. But there's actually some other ways you can check to make sure it was installed correctly. And one of the easiest ways is just to see what version you installed. So there's another uh, function you all can uh, take note of called package version. 
And you just feed it the name of the package. We can hit play. And you can see I have installed 3.4.4. That's the version of ggplot2 I just installed. So now that I've purchased the package, it is mine. I can now turn it on so I can start using some of the functions inside of it. And so that's going to be the role of the library function. I'll hit play. You might see some output. You may not see some output. Again, as long as you're not seeing an error message, then you can be pretty confident that the ggplot2 package is turned on and ready to rock. That's kind of a side note. If you're ever curious to know what packages are kind of loaded in your environment and turned on, there's the packages tab over here in the bottom right-hand corner, and I can search for ggplot2. And oh, it's actually not shown here. Oh, okay, I actually know what's going on. Uh, we'll just kind of ignore that for right now. But you can also load packages by clicking this little button right here. But I think my uh, lock file is a little bit different from my active version. But we're going to talk about that a little bit later. All right, so coming back here to this code chunk, now that I have ggplot2 turned on and ready to rock, I can start using some of the functions inside of it. So here we're going to use the ggplot function to create a plot. We're going to use the MT cars data set. And we're going to plot on the x-axis, MPG, and on the y-axis, WT. And we're going to create a scatter plot or a point plot. So I'll go ahead and hit play. And then here's our beautiful ggplot2, again, using the ggplot2 package that we just installed. But we still have some lingering questions here. Where did I install ggplot2 from? So what was my repository or car dealership? And then once we installed it, we had to put it somewhere on our computer. Where did we put it? So what's our library? Let's go ahead and talk about repositories first. So within R, there are plenty of repositories you can choose from. And here I'm just listing a few of them. Probably the most popular R repository currently out there is something known as CRAN. CRAN stands for the Comprehensive R Archive Network. And how it works is pretty cool. So it's actually not like a single server. It's actually a series of servers scattered throughout the world. And every single one of those servers is completely identical. So they all store the exact same information. And because of that, they're often referred to as mirrors. So you may hear someone say a CRAN mirror. As of March of this year, so a couple months ago now, there was uh, over 19,000 R packages on CRAN. So again, CRAN by far probably the largest repository of R packages. But there's other repositories you can choose from. So there may be some folks on the line here that have leveraged packages within Bioconductor before. So if you're doing any type of bioinformatics, uh, Bioconductor could be a great repository of packages. Um, and as of, again, March of 2023, there's a little over 2,000 packages on Bioconductor. But anywhere you can go shopping for a package can serve as a source of package, a repository. So that can be RForge. It can be GitHub or GitLab, anywhere you can install a package from. So that begs the question, well, what repository am I using? So when in your R Studio environment, our environment, when you install ggplot2, where did you go shopping? You can check that by running this function. So the options function, open and close parentheses, and in quotes, repos, which is just shorthand for repositories. And that will print to the console whatever repository you use to install that package from. So here in this screenshot, you can see I'm actually pointing to an instance of um, Posit's own CRAN mirror. Yours may be this. It may be something different. That's totally fine. But this is how you can check. It's also worth noting that you can see what repository um, you're using and also change your repository using the RStudio IDE. Uh, if you go to Tools, Global Options, and Packages. And I'll go ahead and show you this here in a second. So let's go back to our studio and just ask what question, uh, what repositories you're using for your environment. So again, feel free to run some of these commands in your own environment. But all I'm going to do right here is I'm going to run options repos. And that's just going to print to the console or right underneath this code chunk, my repository. It's worth noting that for the most part, repositories are just going to be URLs, websites. So here you can see this website right here. Let me quickly talk about this, but we're gonna focus in on it a little bit later. So in the first part of this URL, you see colorado.rstudio.com. This is our demo environment here at Posit. We call it Colorado, I have no idea why, we just do. And then we can follow the, the path here, we see RSPM, right? RS is RStudio Package Manager or Posit Package Manager. 
We see all Linux jammy. So we're pulling in Linux binaries. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And then I'm pulling in the latest and greatest packages. So it's just worth noting that in my environment right here in Posit uh, Workbench, I'm pointing to an instance of Posit Package Manager. But if you run this function in your environment, it's likely gonna be a bit different, but this is how you can check to see which repositories you're using. Okay, so we talked about packages, we talked about repositories. Now we're gonna focus in on libraries. And of the three, libraries tends to be the most complex. So we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about libraries. But before we really dig into it, let's just ask the question, where did we put ggplot2 once we installed it? Where's, or what is our library? So there's another function within R um, that's kind of built into R called dot lib paths. And that will print to your console what libraries um, are currently active in your environment. So go ahead and run this in your own environment. And it's worth noting that what you're seeing on the screen, this is my library, at least in the screenshot, yours 100% is going to be different from mine. Because again, this is going to be a directory, like a folder on your computer, which is unique to your environment. So yours is gonna be different. But let's go ahead and just check it. What libraries are you using? I'm gonna come back here and we're just gonna run dot lib paths. No arguments, just the function, we'll hit play. And you can see here, I actually have two libraries. So if you are using something known as RN, you may see multiple libraries, but it's gonna use this top one by default, all right? And so when I go to install a package, this is the path on my system where it's gonna be placed. And I could follow this path if I want to. So using my file directory here in the bottom right-hand corner, you can see I'm currently within this package management R, which is right here. So we can just follow the path. So I can go to RNV, library 4.2, that guy. And here's all the packages that are currently installed on my system. And you can see they're actually just directories uh, within this folder. All right, some notes about our libraries. Some of these points we've already touched upon. The first one, our packages, again, are installed into libraries. These are directories on your system, and they contain a subdirectory for each package installed there, as you just saw. The second point here is something I have not mentioned yet, but I think is really important. Libraries, they're going to be associated with a specific version of R. So take a look at the path you see here on the bottom of your screen, and you'll notice at the very end, you see 4.1. This library is associated with R version 4.1. If I was to install R version 4.2, so another major version of R, that's gonna create a new library for those packages. And then this last point here, library environments are different if you're using RStudio on your local machine, so on your laptop, for example, versus a posit workbench or a server-based environment. So let's actually talk about that last point here. And first, let's go through a scenario where you're running R in our studio on your local machine, let's say your laptop, probably many folks here on the call right now. So in this environment, it's pretty simple because you are the owner of this laptop. So there's one user and there's going to be one R library. And this is known as your own personal system library. So you can go to your packages tab. And if you go to, the, um, you'll see at the very top, you should see system library. Now, when it comes to a server environment, it gets a little bit hairier because now you have a single environment, the server, but you have multiple people logging into the server at once. And so every single user that does log in, they will have their own user library. So every single one of these users will have a library that's called a user library. But there's one additional library, which is can be really powerful and helpful for larger data science teams. And that's known as a shared system library. So if we take a look at this packages tab in this environment, I'm running here within Posit Workbench. You can see all these packages listed here and I actually have two libraries. This first one is my user library. So again, these are packages that I've logged into Posit Workbench and I've installed. So these are my packages, my user packages in my user library. But when I logged in for the very first time without doing anything else, there were actually some packages already installed for me. And that's known as this shared system library. So this is something our system administrator set up. They installed packages onto the server and made them available to everyone. 
All right, so again, this is good if you have a larger data science teams, and that way you don't have to install the same package for every single user. You can just share a package across users. All right, but there's one more library I wanna talk about that wasn't confusing enough. And to introduce this library, let's go through a scenario. Let's say you have, uh, we'll start right here, project one. So you come in Monday morning, your boss sends you an email with a data set and they want you to analyze it. And so you decide you're gonna create some plots. So you're gonna use ggplot2 and we'll just say version one. You create the, the document or whatever. They're really beautiful uh, visualizations and then you send it off for review somewhere. Some time goes by and you get a second project thrown at you and you decide to do the same thing, create some visualizations, but there's now a new version of ggplot2. This We'll just call it version two. So you install the new version, things are going great. But let's say while you're working on project two, project one actually kind of comes back to you. So you get an email saying, oh, we need you to go back to project one and redo some of the plots. And now you're in a bit of a pickle because project one, as you remember, it used version one of ggplot2. So what do you do? Well, you could try to kind of revert ver a ggplot2 back to version one, which is probably easier said than done. Or you can try to bring ggplot2 up to speed with the latest and greatest version, which might work or it might break some things, all right? So it's not great for reproducibility. So what would be much nicer is if we could just isolate these two projects so that project one always used version one and project two always used version two. And you can do that with the help of something known as RStudio projects in combination with a tool known as RENV. So RN is another open source R package that we've developed here at Posit. And it gives you access to a third library or fourth library at this point called a project library. So a little bit about RStudio projects and RN. What are they? So when you use an RStudio project, that gives, that gives this project, whatever you're working on, its own working directory. And inside of that working directory will be your code, data, results, uh, tables, figures, everything associated with that project, including the packages needed for this project and only this project. And that's through the power of our end. So it makes every single project its own isolated environment, which makes it projects much easier to share, makes your projects much more reproducible. And it also gives you access to something known as an RM block file, which we'll, we'll briefly talk about here in a second. But if you've never used projects before, let me just quickly introduce you to how to create them. There's actually a few different ways you can do it in the RStudio IDE. I'm just gonna show you one method. So if you have an RStudio session open, you can go to File, New Project, and that'll bring open this menu here where you can give your project a name. And this is going to create a new directory on your computer. So give that directory a name, where you wanna place that directory on your system. And then importantly, you wanna check this box to use RN with this project, because then that's gonna give you access to that project library. You hit create project. It's gonna open you up in a new RStudio session. You should see the name of the project here in the top right corner. And then if you click on the packages tab, you should now have access to a project library. So again, this library is specific to this project and only this project. And then within the file directory, you'll see a few additional files. So you'll always see this rproj file uh, within the home directory of your project. And then we have this rm directory and we have this rm lock file. So I believe we talked about lock files with your team before, but just quickly introduce you to lock files. This is the first time you're seeing them. This is an example lock file and they're very ugly to look at because they're written in this JSON format, but they're actually pretty easy to read. You can start right up here at the very top and see what our version was used for this project, so 4.1, what active repositories were used for the project, so where did this user go and get their packages? You can see it's CRAN. And then everything else is just information about the packages in this project. So here we have two listed, Markdown and MIME. You can see their associated versions, so that's something that RM is really good at, is keeping track of what versions of packages you use, where you obtain them, and then you'll also see this hash here. We're not gonna to talk too much about that today, but that's important for global package caching. Okay, so to summarize what we talked about with libraries, because again, libraries is a bit confusing. Hopefully this flow diagram helps out a little bit, but if you just ask the question, if you install a package, where does it go? So if you start up here at the very top, we install ggplot2. 
the first question you should ask is, are you using an RStudio project? If yes, are you using RMV? And if yes, then the answer is that, pa that package is going to go into your project library. But if you're not using RMV or if you're not within an RStudio project, the next question becomes, where are you running R? Are you running it on your local desktop or laptop? In that case, it'll go into your personal system library. Or are you running on a server like Posit Workbench, in which case it'll go into your personal user library. So those are kind of like the three main libraries to keep track of uh, as you're working through R. Okay, so now that we've covered packages, libraries, and repositories, let's talk about uh, the not so fun stuff. Uh, and that is package dependency conflicts, or basically what happens when things go wrong. So let me run through a scenario with you. I'm going to pick a random date. This is completely arbitrary. We'll say January 1st, 2020. You open up R in R Studio and you install a package. We'll focus on the Tibble package, which some of you may be familiar with. So we go and in install dot packages, the Tibble package. It is very common in R and also in Python for packages to depend on other packages. So by installing the Tibble package, it actually by default will install three dependencies, the rlang, CLI, and CRAN packages. Now, again, on this date, we installed Tibble and all these dependencies, so they're all being installed at the exact same time. And there's actually a cool thing that CRAN does. So again, that big repository of R packages. CRAN always tests to ensure that the latest packages always work together. So if you install these packages on the exact same date, all the packages and the versions and dependencies, they should all work nicely together. You shouldn't get any conflicts. But let's fast forward a month. I'm just picking some arbitrary time. And you go back into that same R environment where you install Tibble. Oops. And you now install another package. And we'll focus on the package down package. So you install package down. It turns out package down actually has the same three dependencies, rlang, CLI, and CRAN. But because this is being installed a month later, it turns out there's actually some new versions of these various dependencies, which is why they're kind of shaded in this darker gray color. So by installing package down on February 1st, it'll automatically update the rlang, CLI, and CRAN packages. But what it will not do is update the Tibble package itself. And now you're in a bit of a broken state because you have an old version of Tibble that's trying to use new versions of its dependencies. And you may run into some issues where functions aren't behaving as expected. So how do we get around this? Well, I mentioned before that CRAN tests to ensure that the latest packages always work together. So because of that, it's very common for data science teams to do something what's known as freezing a repository to a set date. So let me explain how this works. So again, we have a two dates right here and we have January 1st, 2020. And let's say that you as the user or your administrator decides to freeze your repository to this date, February 1st. You install Tibble, things go great. And then you fast forward to February 1st. But even though it's February 1st, your repository is still frozen to January 1st. So you go to install package down on, in February, but it still installs it as if it's January 1st. So no matter when you installed any subsequent packages, they're all being installed as if it's the same time. So all these packages, again, should work together because that's the added service that CRAN provides. Okay, now that we've talked about a bunch of different things, you might have some questions kind of circulating in your head as you start to devise your own package management strategy. You know, things like who is going to be responsible for reproducing the environment? Is that going to be up to the data scientists, the users, or is it going to be up to my system administrators? Also, how open is the environment? Can a user install a new package or are they going to be locked down to a specific version? You know, should we be using the shared system libraries or just specific user libraries? And really, you have to weigh the pros and cons specific to your team. It's also, it's nice to talk to other teams as well and to kind of see what they're doing, but ultimately you have to find, um, you know, a solution that kind of meets your team's needs. Now, having said that, we have worked with a bunch of teams here at Posit where we've seen package management strategies succeed and we've seen some strategies not so succeed. And so the way you're seeing on this plot right here, um, we're showing you a few different strategies that we're going to touch upon. 
On the y-axis, we're looking at package access. So that's asking, can a user install whatever package they want? So is it open or is it fairly locked down? So they're kind of constrained to specific packages or specific versions. And then on the x-axis, we're looking at who is responsible for reproducing the environment. Is that gonna be up to your system administrators or is it gonna be up to the data scientists? We find teams had the most success somewhere along this diagonal. And we're actually gonna talk about these three strategies. We're gonna start with snapshot, then we'll talk about shared baseline, and then finally a validated strategy. And then we'll, we'll just briefly touch upon some of these other strategies where we see things go a little bit haywire. So let's go ahead and start with snapshot in the top right corner here. For every single one of these strategies, we'll kind of talk about you know, what they are and then some pros and cons of each. So in a snapshot strategy, users are able to freely access and install whatever package they want, but you must be using RStudio projects and that RM package we talked about before. You have to be using that RM lock file. So in this scenario, users are gonna have the full responsibility to record the dependencies needed for a project. So in a typical workflow, you would create a project, you then write some code, install some packages, write more code, install other packages, and you use the, that RMF package to snapshot your environment, to record what packages you're using. That's going to update that lock file, which you can then use to restore your environment if needed. Now, the pros for a snapshot is that it definitely gives users access to pretty much any package and any version they want to use. Um, and I, the second point right here, I put it as a pro, but depending on your team, you may consider it a con. Um, it's really going to require little to no IT or sysadmin involvement. It's really going to be on the shoulders of the users. And that's going to be, that kind of leads me to my co major con here, is that if you're brand new to R and now you're being tasked with keeping track of every package you're using and the versions, that can be a, a, slightly, a slight barrier for those that are brand new to R. Now, it's worth noting that if you are running RStudio locally on your personal laptop, we'd certainly recommend that you use this strategy for all of your projects. Okay, the second strategy we're gonna talk about is something known as a shared baseline. And it's just like a side note, this is actually what we use internally here at Posit. In this strategy, all or most of CRAN, so all 19, 20,000 packages of CRAN are made available to every single user via that shared system library. But users are still able to freely access and install any package they want, any version they want, um, you know, and they can install it into their own project and or user library. So the reason why we really like this strategy, um, you know, it's good for both those that are new to R and more advanced users. Um, for those that are new, all these packages are already there available to them. Um, but for the advanced R users, they can still reach out and grab, you know, a development version of a package or the latest and greatest. It can also reduce duplicate package installs across users. So I mentioned before that when you use that shared baseline strategy, that prevents every single user installing the same package in their own user library. And especially if you have a large data science team, that can be a bit of a waste of space. I do put this asterisk here, though, because for the most part, Packages in R are not very big. They're just a series of text files. So uh, it's not really going to take up that much space on your system, but it can be a way to save up, uh, I know, a couple uh, megabytes. Now, the cons here, if you're not running a posit within a, a server environment, then this strategy is not going to be available to you. So it's not going to be available for desktop R users. And then that shared library, it may not include the latest and greatest, and it's ultimately going to be controlled by your system administrators. The last strategy we'll talk about is something known as a validated strategy. And this is a very popular strategy, especially amongst our pharmaceutical, our life sciences groups, folks that are going to be you know, submitting things to say like the some regulatory agency like the FDA here in the States. So in a validated strategy, it's going to restrict access to a particular set of packages that your team deems as validated. Now I put validated in quotes, because a question that I routinely get is, hey, Ryan, is this package considered validated or not? I would love to be able to answer that question, but unfortunately, every single team is unique and what one team may consider something validated, another team may not. And so every single team kind of has to create their own series of 
you know, checks to determine if a package is considered validated and use their own judgment. Now, also for users of a validated environment, if they want to use a package that's not currently considered validated, then they're kind of out of luck and they have to go through an approval process to hopefully get that package um, you know, validated in their environment. Now, the pros here with a validated strategy and why it's so important for our pharmaceutical groups is that you can confidently recreate the same environment and outcome. So if you go to submit something to the FDA, you want to make sure that the results, the same thing, you'll get results today, you'll get the same results a week from now, a year from now, 10 years from now. So you really have to make sure that these analyses do not change at all. And you can trust what's in your environment. Right? You've done your homework, you know every single thing about every single package in your environment. So you can be very confident, be very safe in this uh, validated environment. Now, there's certainly going to be quite a few cons. It will require a lot more IT and sysadmin involvement. Also, maintaining a validated environment is not a trivial task. And I've worked with groups that have dedicated teams just to maintaining a validated environment. And then finally, users can be constrained to select packages. So if there's if they see online or on social media, there's a new package with a function that works perfect for them, they may not have access to it because it's not considered validated. All right, another flow diagram. We're not going to talk about this one, but again, when I share the slides, you can read through this. And what I'm trying to do is guide users into what package management strategy they should at least consider. Uh, so starting up here with the user at the very top. So you can see in green here, the three strategies we just talked about, snapshot, shared baseline, and validated. But here in red, we also have some strategies which tend not to be so good. Um, and their names kind of... Uh, uh, kind of tip the hat to what they uh, are. So the first strategy is known as Wild West. And so in a Wild West, there's basically no regard for reproducibility. They can install whatever package they want into whatever library they want, whatever version. This is where you run into those package dependency conflicts most frequently. We also have something known as a ticket system. It's very similar to a validated environment because a user will require um, to have to submit a ticket in order to get access to a package. But the issue is that the folks that are approving said tickets don't have much regard for reproducibility and they can just either deny or just add packages willy nilly, which could also result in dependency conflicts. And then we have a blocked environment, which is just a, a lose lose situation for both sides of the coin. In a blocked environment, the, usually the internet is cut off. Uh, there's no way to reach out externally for packages. And so in order to use functions outside of kind of base R, users are going to have to figure out some like backdoor ways to get packages in there and it causes security concerns. So this is never a good solution uh, really for any team. So we're getting pretty close to the end here. And we've talked about a lot of different things from the perspective of your data scientists, your developers, but also your system administrators and your IT teams. Things like, you know, what repositories are we going to use? Are we going to use CRAN, Bioconductor? Are we going to pull in packages from source? Um, are we going to use Python packages, which we haven't even talked about today? You know, where are we going to be running code? Are we going to have users leverage their own laptops? Or are we going to use Posit Workbench, a server-based environment? And then for our repositories, are we going to make them the latest and greatest packages available? Or are we going to freeze a repository to a specific date? So that's a lot of different questions that have to answer. So what we've done here at Posit is create a tool to hopefully help uh, simplify this a bit. And that's called Posit Package Manager. So if you've never heard of Posit Package Manager before, here's just a few bullet points that get you up to speed. Posit Package Manager, just like all of our internal, um, our, our professional tools, these are internal solutions. So they can be installed on a Linux server, either on-prem, like literally physically next to you, or they can be installed in whatever cloud environment you want. But importantly, they can stay within your network, within your firewall, all right? And so that can be really important for teams that don't have any outside access to uh, the internet. And you can do some cool things with it. Like you can have your own NHS CRAN mirror if you wanted to. So all 19,000 packages on CRAN, you can have your own personal CRAN mirror. Also, for anyone on the line that develops their own packages, either in R or Python, you can now give those packages a home. So most times folks will have them hosted on like GitHub or something like that, which, you know, if they're public, then that's great. But maybe if they're not public 
or maybe kind of versioning could be an issue. Um, you can now host them on Package Manager and easily install them and share them across your team. And then you can create customized repositories. So we only talked about CRAN, but you can create your own subsets of uh, repositories and freeze them to specific dates. And I'll show you that here in a second. But this fourth bullet point is really the main take home message is that Package Manager is designed to be your one-stop shop. If we go back to our car uh, dealership analogy, so you remember a repository is a car dealership. Let's say there's uh, a new dealership that shows up on the street and just buys all of the other local dealerships and now becomes this one mega dealership. That's essentially what Package Manager is, is that you don't have to worry about reaching out to all these various sources. You can just bring them all together into a centralized location. So you can serve CRAN packages, Bioconductor, PyPI, um, all within one location. The last two points are kind of more aimed to your system administrators. Um, you can easily manage package and system dependencies using Package Manager, and I'll show you that here in a second. And you can also serve Linux binaries. So if you are using a server-based environment for all of your development on a Linux server, and you go to install a package, um, you can know that sometimes that takes a while to build a package from source code. But something that Posit Package Manager does is like an added service is that it serves Linux binaries or pre-built binaries. So we'll talk about those here in a second. So let me actually, um, before we jump into a demo of Package Manager, let me actually show you what Package Manager looks like. So I'm going to come in here to my demo environment, and we'll select Package Manager. Now, again, for the most part, Package Manager is going to be a tool that is maintained and configured by your system administrators. But there is a more or less a user interface that your data scientists or anyone else on your team can access and see what repositories and what packages are available to them. And we'll first start over here on the left-hand side of your screen, this little sidebar. And you can see we have three different types of repositories. We have R repositories, we have Bioconductor repositories, and we have Python repositories. And within the R ecosystem, you can see we've developed, again, this is just our demo environment. So we've created about seven or so different repositories. Your team, if you want to develop your own repositories, you absolutely can. But to run through a few of these, you can see here I've selected a CRAN mirror. So all 19,000 or so packages on CRAN, are now on a custom repository that we are hosting on our instance of Package Manager. You also can have internal repositories. So any package, our package you've developed internally, you can now host them in an internal repository. Here's like a validator repository subset. So again, you can choose and create whatever repositories you want based on your team's needs. Here again, you can access any Bioconductor package. And then for any Python developers, any package that's currently on PyPI, which is probably the largest repository of Python packages, there's about a half a million Python packages, you can have your own PyPI mirror and also host any internally developed Python packages. But for right now, let's just go ahead and select CRAN. So you can see CRAN is here in the top left corner and we'll see some tabs along the top here. So starting on packages, this is just a way for you to explore all the various packages in CRAN. So if I wanted to search for ggplot2, I can do that and I can see, you know, how do I install it? What's the most recent version, 3.4.4? You can also just get some more information about this package. Uh, one of the fun things I like to look at for packages like ggplot2, which are very popular, is things like reverse imports. These are all packages on CRAN that depend on ggplot2. So by installing, say, the Abacus package, it will automatically install the ggplot2 package as well. And there's about 3,000 packages on CRAN that depend on ggplot2. And then scrolling down some more here, you can also see archived versions. So if you needed to go back to a previous version of a package, uh, you can actually click on it and it'll provide you with the code how to install a previous version into your active environment. So moving across the tabs here, we have activity. So as I mentioned before, Package Manager, Manager will actually reach out to various sources and bring all those packages together into a centralized location. But it does need to make periodic checks to those various sources, or what we call syncs. So you can set up Package Manager to have as many syncs as you want at whatever cadence you want. And every time it performs a sync, you can come in here to the Activity tab and see you know, what packages on CRAN were added, which ones are archived, and if any packages were deleted. So it's just kind of more for your information. 
But the real magic of Package Manager occurs right here, the Setup tab. And the first thing I'll mention here is repository URL. So as we talked about before, when we ran options repos, uh, when you point to a repository, that's a URL. That's all it is. So if you want to use this instance of Package Manager and you want to pull in packages from this instance, all you need to do is grab the URL right down here at the bottom. And we actually already saw this URL. So again, colorado.posit.co, that's our demo environment. Our studio or posit package manager. Here I am on the CRAN repository. And then you're going to see something called Linux Focal. I mentioned uh, in this last slide that you can actually serve Linux binaries. And so here I'm supplying Linux binaries for Ubuntu 20, which is also known as Focal. But you can choose whatever distribution is running Posit Workbench or Posit Connect uh, so that you can serve that flavor of Linux as well. And then the last thing you'll see here is latest. And so that means if I use this entire URL, it's going to pull in Linux binaries and it's always going to pull in the latest and greatest versions of whatever package I, packages I ask. But again, depending on your team's package management strategy, maybe this is not what you want to do. And instead, you want to freeze a repository to a specific date. So to do that, that's where this calendar comes into play. You can just select a date. So I can go back to October 3rd of this month. And now you can see the URL has changed. And you can see at the very end, instead of saying latest, it now says October 3rd of 2023. If I use this URL, no matter what date I am into the future, it will always install packages as if it's October 3rd of 2023. All right, scrolling down just a little bit more, install system prerequisites. This is another added service of Package Manager in that it will look into every single one of these repositories on the left-hand side and extract any system dependencies needed for your flavor of Linux, or if you're running on Mac or Windows, and provide your system administrators with a customized script. So what you're seeing right here is a pretty massive script because it will install every single system dependency needed for Ubuntu 20 for every single package on CRAN. That way you can always ensure that when your data scientists go to install a package on you know, Posit Workbench or Connect, that the packages just work and those system dependencies are there for them. And then finally, you can see instructions for how to leverage Package Manager if you're using Posit Workbench or if you're just running the RStudio IDE on your local desktop um, computer. You can also set it programmatically by altering, say, like your R profile um, file. OK, so now we know a little bit more about Package Manager. Let's come back here to RStudio. And I'm actually going to switch over to a different session of RStudio. This is one of the benefits of Posit Workbench is I can have multiple sessions going. I'm going to go to this Posit Package Manager demo um, project. All right, so let me go ahead and clear my output. And we're just going to review a few things and then talk about how we can uh, leverage Package Manager here. So in this first code chunk, we're just going to install ggplot2, and then I'm going to check to see what version I installed. So let's go ahead and run this command. All right, and we see some output. Again, if you run this command in your environment, your output might be different, that's okay. And then you can see that I've installed version 3.4.4, which as you may recall, is the latest version of ggplot2. We scroll down a little bit further and we just ask the question, where did I install it from? So what are my repositories? So we can run options repos. I'll hit play. And here you can actually see I'm pointing to a bunch of different repositories. Um, but if we're done here at the bottom, here's that instance of RStudio Package Manager that we are talking about earlier. Now, this is where I want to show how fast are these pre-built Linux binaries. I'm actually going to run this code chunk right here, and then I'll show you, kind of, I'll kind of explain the code. So here we're going to install ggplot2 just like we did before but I'm now manually changing the repository. And if you check the repository, you're not seeing Linux, you know, focal or anything like that in the path. That's because I'm now going to install this package from source and then check to see how long it takes. So you can see here down at the bottom, it's installing from source and it's taking a little bit of time. So we'll give it a few more seconds here. All right, almost done. And there we go. You can see it took about 30, almost 37 seconds to install ggplot2 from source. 
Now, again, this concept of like binaries and source um, isn't quite clicking just yet. Another way to think about it, and we'll go back to our car analogy. If you install a package from source code, think of that as purchasing a new car, but instead of it coming as a, a car, it comes as a series of packages, like the tires are in one package, the engine's in another package, and you have to assemble that car before you can drive it. That's what it's like to install packages from source. You get all the separate components, and then you have to build it for your specific system that you're working within. A binary means that that package comes pre-built specific to your environment. So that car is already built and ready to be interacted with immediately. So it took about 37 seconds to install this package from source. And in the second code chunk, we're gonna do the exact same thing, but now you can see Linux jamming in the path. So we're gonna install a pre-built Linux binary. So I'll hit play here. And it's done. And you can see it took about seven and a half seconds. So it's a pretty dramatic um, speed up to install packages as Linux binaries. You may be saying like, oh, well, Ryan, no, 37 seconds isn't that long. I can wait 37 seconds. But let's say, for example, you are building, let's say like custom Docker images for your, your projects. And you have to install, let's say like 100 or 1,000 packages at once. That could take hours to run. And so by using Linux binaries, you can you know, slice that number in half to just a couple minutes to install a bunch of packages into your custom Docker images. Then the last thing I'll mention here, we'll just show you how to go back in time or to freeze repositories to specific dates. I'm going to go ahead and run this command here and then I'll talk about what's going on. So we're gonna install uh, ggplot2 one more time, but here the URL you can see at the very end is actually a snapshot, or sorry, it's frozen to a specific date. So November 2nd of 2020. So we're gonna install ggplot2 as if it's that date. And then we're gonna check to see what version we installed. So let's just give this a few seconds to run. And it should be almost done. And there we go. You can see at the very bottom here, on November 2nd of 2020, um, ggplot was at version 3.3.2, All right? So again, that's how you can use that snapshot feature uh, to go back in time to install previous versions of a package. All right, and just to wrap things up, some final thoughts. Um, it may, uh, hopefully it's probably apparent at this point that package environment management, it is not easy. Um, and every team is going to be different. So you, you really have to kind of talk internally um, to devise your own uh, personal package management strategy that meets your team's needs. But I will say one thing that um, for every team that has implemented a successful package management strategy, one thing that's conserved is that they have good communication between whoever's managing the environment on the back end. So like the servers, um, anything like that, so your IT or system administrators and the end users. So keeping a good line of communication between those groups is paramount. So um, if you haven't established that uh, relationship just yet, it might be time to uh, walk down the, the hall or the virtual hall and say hello um, as you're starting to develop your own package management strategy. All right, I know we left um, probably about 30 or so minutes uh, or a little bit early, so happy to use any of the remainder of time to answer any questions the best I can. Um, and if I can't answer those questions, I'll be sure to track those down um, and follow up in an email. Great, thanks Ryan. Yeah, I think one question's come through already. So please do uh, put any more questions in the chat if you want to, or you can just shout up if you like. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> just before we go into questions, well, no, no I'll do, I was gonna, I was going to thank you because the webinar was so interesting, but I'll do that at the end, actually. Let's have the questions first. Um, <laughs> right, yeah. So the first question that's coming is, how do you set up the project library with the RM package? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and we do, and I can't actually recall if we've actually had that uh, webinar with your team already, but I do have a separate webinar that's much more focused on RMV. Um, we briefly talked about it. Let me actually share my screen one more time, and I'll, I can actually just show you one way to to do that. So we're going to go zip back in time here to right here. So this slide is just going to show you these two slides will show you how you can initialize an RStudio project with RM right out of the gate. So you have like a brand new project that you're creating. 
So all you need to do is within an RStudio session, go to file new project and you should see this window. And to initialize this project with our env and to get access to that project library, make sure you check this box right here, use our env with this project. And then once you hit create project, it'll plop you into a new RStudio session inside of that project with that project library ready to go. Now, the other question that I sometimes get is, well, what if I already have an RStudio project, but it's not using RN currently? That's kind of what my other webinar focuses on, but just to briefly talk about it, um, you know, for example, if I was in this RStudio session and I'm not using RN, you can initialize projects, so pre-existing projects with RN by running RN init. You, all you have to do is run that function and it'll automatically you know, create a that RM lock file, the RM directory, and it will um, initialize the project with a project library. So those are kind of the two main methods I would suggest for getting access to that project library in our end. Yeah, I've got a question. I think, I mean, you touched on it here and there, but I just um, wonder if I could ask a more specific question. So I think what people will often be in a situation, I think, where they are doing lots of Good work with kind of version with package management so they've written this beautiful package and they spent ages but then they want to share it with people and i'm just wondering those people might because i find of rm very faffy to be honest i've been sent stuff and rm will will it you know it can be a bit intimidating or confusing yeah. or difficult to work with so just wondering what's your advice if you've done it all right how do you help other people to kind of pick up on your good work with like leveraging rm and just kind well, of general yeah or, or is there a, is there a way that's easier for because i put i mean you know i do love rm i get the point of it yeah. but it can be heavyweight in my in my so i wondered if you'd say oh well actually sometimes you know there's a, there's a way that's a bit less of a, a bit less you know intimidating for people yeah i mean so rm like chris mentioned it's a it's a really amazing package and all it's trying to do is it's absolutely best to help you out in terms of managing your packages because as we discussed today, things can certainly go wrong. And so RM is trying its best to be a helper. It's never trying to be like a, an extra burden for folks to, to manage, but it can certainly feel like that because there's a lot that goes into RN and there's with package management, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. So when things go wrong, the question then becomes like, well, how can I then use RM to kind of help make things go right? Um, so there's lots of different functions within RM to kind of uh, speak to a lot of those points. But if you're brand new to RM and you're just like, you know, how do I get started? How do I get comfortable using RM? There's really just like two or three functions that you need to remember. And we just talked about one of them. So if you um, want to initialize a project with RM, um, and I noticed there was a question here about like difference between RM to activate and RM to init. Init's going to initialize a project that's never used RN before, all right? So it's it's not seen RN, and it's going to set the stage with a project that will now subsequently be using RN. Activate will take a project that has RN, kind of all the, the architecture for it, but it hasn't been essentially turned on. Uh, and so Activate will kind of kick it on. Init's going to create that project for you with the project library. At that point, the stage is set. You can just go about your data science business. You really don't have to think too much about RN. But as you wrap up for the day, um, and you know, as you've been writing some code, you've probably installed some packages, or maybe you've updated some packages. At that point, you want to just you know take a snapshot and record all those new packages and new versions that are in your project. So the other function you need to remember is snapshot, and that will automatically update the lock file for you. Those two functions, the snapshot one is probably one of the more important ones because that's going to keep track of that lock file. Like you see right down here which I can click on. And you can see for this project, it's a little bit more extensive and it's keeping track of all these packages and their associated versions. You, for the most part, never have to uh, manually edit this. RM will take care of it for you. And that, and that alone, like this RM block file, this is an important file because now if I wanted to share this project with Chris, for example, I can now have a record of what packages I use for this project and what versions. And that's again, that's a perfect like, Step one, that's it. Now, if for example, Chris does want to take this project and he wants to restore his environment to match mine, then the other function you need to remember is rm restore. 
And that will read in a lock file and it will store a project library to match that lock file. Those are the three functions that if you're just getting started with RN, init, snapshot, restore, those are the only three you need to remember that will get you through probably like 90% of your RN workflows. But there's a few other ones that, you know, depending on your use case, and especially if you're collaborating with others or you're developing packages within RNV, um, there might be a few other functions to uh, check out. In which case, I would just recommend um, the RNV GitHub pages because the documentation is actually pretty awesome. And we just, um, Kevin, who's the main developer of RNV, just kind of redid them like about a half a year ago. I wonder whether people maybe haven't called RM snapshot and have sent me code. Maybe mm. because people have sent me stuff that appears to be broken, but and I didn't I didn't know it was me or them. Anyway, um, yeah. right. What else have we got in the chat? Oh yeah. So there's a question. Um, would you start basically all projects by including the repository URL for the install most recent packages and then change that URL down the line? Yeah, that's a it's a good question. Again, these are the things that are going to depend on your team um, and kind of what kind of strategy you want to set forth moving forward. I would say the most conservative thing you can probably do is that when you have a brand new project you've just created and you can essentially set the repository URL and freeze it to that specific date. All right. So that's going to be very conservative because essentially you're now saying, okay, I'm going to start this project on this date. And in the future, like a month from now, if there's a new package out there. I'm not going to use it. I'm going to, going to use the packages associated with that specific um, date. So that's that's one way to do it. And there's advantages to that because that way you know that things are never going to break. Right? You are basically stuck in one state. Um, but if a new package version comes out and you're like, man, I really want to use that version or that new function inside that package, um, then you got to think about ways on how to kind of incrementally upgrade packages and make sure that uh, it doesn't break any dependencies. And that's something that RM does uh, try its best to help you out with. So it'll kind of let you know if dependencies are out of state or out of um, sync, uh, and we'll do its best to kind of inform you and provide you with next steps to get everything up to a, a happy working state. But again, it's ultimately up to you and your team and how you want to design projects. Um, I do see one question in the chat as well, um, where someone says they, they don't have access to that new project. Um, and it's interesting because you're actually within Posit Cloud, which is totally fine. But just uh, kind of a behind the scenes, Posit Cloud, the way it works, every single R Studio session you open by default is a project. All right. So that's why within Posit Cloud, there's actually not a feature to create a project because you're already in a project. So what you do, essentially, if you had that button in Posit Cloud, you'd be creating a project within a project. Um, that's just the way Posit Cloud works by default. So every single R Studio session you open is a project. Um, but if you're running R Studio on your local computer, like the local desktop application or Posit Workbench, then you should see the uh, the new project uh, option. And not not a dumb question because I actually give a a webinar in creating and sharing R packages. And for those that have developed packages before, you know you typically create a project for that. And I do the session within Posit Cloud, and that part's like. If you're like, oh, trust me, people, we're not creating a project because, well, everything I just said. So not not a silly question at all. Right. Okay. I can't see any more questions in the chat, I don't think. Anybody else want to either shout up or type anything? Yeah, I think that might be it. We've had a decent, um, we've had a decently sized webinar anyway, so I think people are probably uh, ready for a cup of tea by now. Um, yeah. But yeah, so thanks for. I mean, uh, you know, um, NHSI webinars are always good, and the positive ones are always good. But I just want to just say on a personal note that that was a very, 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 very interesting. So Kaylee and I have been teaming on it a bit in the background um, because uh, Kaylee's saying it's make, you know, Kaylee's not a data scientist by trade, but she's been saying a lot of it makes sense to her. So you've really, you know, the beginning of the webinar, you were on, we were on the very, very basics of, of package management, mm -hmm. weren't we? But real basic stuff. And then by the end, you were talking about some really important, like big questions in managing really important big data science models. So I think that was, I'm going to, I'm not sure um, if my team are here or not, but I should be recommending that they all um, have, a, have a watch back because that was a really um, a good way of going all the way from just starting out to actually, you know, uh, some big complicated issues um so yes so thanks very much that was excellent uh, i'm sure everyone in the audience will agree uh yeah and thanks pleasure. also for letting us put on youtube that's really excellent that people can uh, can catch up in their own time
Yeah, absolutely. And let me know when you post it because uh, I might actually use that link as well. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll do. Um, I wish I could say what the next webinar is, but unfortunately we don't know because we haven't organized it yet, but there will be another webinar and I'm sure it will be marvelous. Uh, so please do come along. Uh, yeah, the YouTube link will be shared uh, on Slack, on Twitter, Mastodon, all the places we normally share. And I'll let, Pos um, I'll let Ryan at Posit have a link uh, as well. So uh, do look out for that. And uh, the slides, where will the slides be, Ryan? Um, I'll send them over to you, Chris. Um, and then you can yeah. kind of do what so you want. So if you want to, yeah, it, yeah. So I, I don't know what we do with slides, but uh, if you email nhs.rcommunity at nhs.net, you can have the slides. There might be a clever okay. way of just reading the slides that I don't know about, but please, if you do want the slides, just let us know. We'll, we'll make sure that you get them. Sounds good. Great. Well, thanks again. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thanks, Ryan, for an excellent presentation, and we'll see you all next time. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Cheers.